Hey, good morning. This is Meg Riley in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where it snowed last night. Yes, it did. It didn't stick, but still, it's May. <laughs> Aisha Hauser, I'm hoping it's better where you are. Uh, it's, I'm Aisha Hauser. I'm in Seattle. It doesn't know what it wants to be. It's either spring, sort of summer, but then we ha I learned a new word moving to the Northwest. January. So as soon as June hits, it's going to get cold and rainy. And, and um, so this is a faux nice weather kind of thing, but it is beautiful. I can't lie. Um, Margalee, how are you? Hello. I'm doing great. Actually, it's pretty sunny here. I've uh, had my uh, sliding glass door open a few times. I haven't done it yet this morning, but it's really nice. And I'm coming to you from Cromwell, Connecticut. And uh, as you May, remember, I provide technical support. So I'll be looking at your questions and comments and make sure that the panel is aware of your thoughts and questions and so on. So back to you, Meg. Well, we're excited to be joined this morning by Darrell Farrar, the Director of Music at First Unitarian Church of Portland and the President-elect of the Association of UU Music Ministries. That's exciting. So we'll be talking about music today. We're having a little technical difficulty, so we may be joined by some other people late. We'll see. We'll welcome them if and when they arrive. Aisha, anything in a UU Roundup school that you um, need to bring up today? I've, I've got nothing. I don't know. No, I don't think so. Um, yeah, I was trying to, I guess, I guess UU land has been quiet, which maybe is a good thing. I never know. Um, it hasn't been quiet. I'm sure people are doing stuff, but it's not on my radar. I got the new pocket guide in the mail. Oh, yes. have a piece in it. I do. And then I found pocket guides. I wish I brought them. I'm not in the office. From 1954 for 35 cents. And then there was a pocket guide from 1970. It's either 74 or 76. I don't know how much that was. But they're pretty funny to look at old uh, pocket guides. Maybe they have one woman author, usually all white men. Um, they're pretty funny. But yes, I'm in the new pocket. The pocket guide is... It's got pictures, reading, songs. It's completely redesigned pocket guide. So I hope everyone gets several copies. <laughs> and it feels a lot friendlier. I, I just read some of it. I read your piece, but it just feels a lot more, hey, welcome, than some of the past ones have been like, of course, you want to know all about our history. <laughs> Not really, no. So anyway, I'm excited about it. I hope that people use it well. And a couple of pieces of it, my only gripe, are from Testimony, my book, without acknowledgement. I just want to grumble about that for one second. But, you know, <laughs> that's life. It's, they they're didn't all give Skinner testimony? House. Oh, that, no, that's a serious thing to grumble about. They did not give testimony. Because Anissa Sheikh, who was one of the youth from my congregation who's in your book, uh, they lifted it right out so that it doesn't say, oh, yikes, I missed that. Oh, Jake's that. piece, that piece, and... Uh, that's not cool. Oh, Roberta Finkelstein's piece are all also in testimony. So they, House. Did, they did reference testimony, but you know, it would have been good to plug it a little more, I thought. Of course. Yeah. But I liked that it had that feeling of testimony at any rate, even if it was kind of lifted. <laughs> you know, it's better than the people who sold t-shirts with the rainbow path that I invented on them without me knowing about it. <laughs> You know, you just, I mean, my name was on it, but I couldn't believe it when I saw a t-shirt. I was like, because I did it with someone else. Her name wasn't on it. I was like, oh my God. Anyway, we got to just get better at that. And that's related to music, among other things. <laughs> Misappropriation, uh, non-acknowledgement. So I'm very excited to have you with us today. Um, um, I, for our, yeah. I do have two things that I'd oh, like to mention. Oh, speak you know, up. We have, uh, as a seminary, and I have to mention, we have uh, graduations around the corner for um, folks from Meadville and um, Star King and I'm sure other places. And the other thing is just kind of want to encourage people to keep having um, babies and bailout um, watch parties uh, to support the efforts of, of Blue. Well, to we went, since I botched it last week and mixed it up, why don't you describe the CLF ARE event and how that how that went on Tuesday? Oh, okay. So that went excellently. We had a watch party um, with, it was an effort by three groups. Oh gosh, I'm going to forget the name of that congregation in California, but Rodney's congregation, uh, do you remember the name of it? Meg? Walnut Creek, isn't it? No, Mount oh, Diablo, Mount Diablo. Yes, Mount Mexico. Diablo, thank you. It was an effort between Mount Diablo, CLF, and ARE. 
and um, really, we really um, had a great group, and we have raised way more funds. How much? We, had, we are that initially. The thing is, initially, we had a goal of a thousand, and within hours, we were at the halfway mark. So we raised it to five thousand. And then we matched, that was raised before we had the watch party. So we increased it again. So um, last time I checked, we were at the 6,000 mark. So folks have really been responding. It's been going really well. That's great. Great news. How did yours go, Aisha? Ours went well, it was small, but that's okay. What, what the people who did show up were our social justice um, folks from uh, they're the committee. So they're, we're actually going to show it again and do a second watch party and have a much more coordinated effort to um, not only uh, uh, support babies and bailouts, but also the bit larger effort of um, ending mass incarceration. Um, so it went, it went really well. It was, it was, if you haven't watched it, even if you're not part of a watch party, it was, inc it was compelling isn't even the word. It was, it was inspiring. It was, it was it was, it was deeply moving, painful. Um, so I highly recommend everybody view it because it, it kind of changes you. It does something where it's like, wow, this is, we, we need to pay more attention to humanity um, and other humans. And the idea that again, humans are in cages is one that the fact that we've been sold that bill of goods uh, is, yeah, it's a cancer on our collective soul uh, for profit prison. So um, yeah. yeah for profit prisons and all the privatization of everything within them. Even the ones that aren't for profit might as well. I mean, everything. Yeah. That's I'm, I'm really inspired by that. And I haven't watched it yet, but I want to, because I'm preaching this week on care and what exactly what you said, what does it do to our soul when human beings are being, babies are being ripped from their parents and mothers are being ripped from their families all because of money. Um, yeah. What is, what does that say about who we are? Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks, Margalie, for all the work you and, and all the people who put in all the work on that watch party. It's great. And all the watch parties all over the country. And we need to give a shout out to Paige Ingram, who coordinated all of this from Black Lives of UU. Paige Ingram, Kiana Perkins, who's from yeah. Ann Arbor. Just want to give them a shout out. Absolutely. And, and they've developed a, a thing to use between now and next May, a curriculum to stay on this. So I really hope people go to the blue page, look at it, download it. Um, yeah, and Paige is really doing great organizing. Local here, I just have to say. <laughs> we have good organizers in the Twin Cities. So, okay, well, because Lena's here too. It's kind of, you know, the Minneapolis hub of Black Lives of you. <laughs> Minneapolis, which isn't as white as Portland, Oregon, <laughs> where Darrell Ferrar is from the whitest city in America. So let's start talking about music. I'm, well, I'm really excited, first of all, to learn that you're the president at the Musicians Network. I'm always the last to know everything like that. So what's your vision for that? Let's start there. Uh, sure, so I'm, so I'm not the president yet. Um, elect, if, elect. If the president's elect, if things go the way some people hope they go, I will be the president in January. Um, and my, my, if there's a vision at all um, that, that, that lives in me that doesn't live in the board as a whole, um, it might be to sort of really take seriously um, an opportunity to level the playing field for all religious professionals. Um, it's, uh, it's the sort of weird second class uh, culture of, we need you, but we can't pay you um, for, for music directors and, and musicians in, in UU churches. It's just a weird thing. Um, we, you know, we, we love your talents, but don't need your voice. That sort of culture um, uh, needs, to be, needs to be handled. And I don't, I, I don't promise to handle it in three years, but, um, but I, do, I do promise to say it out loud. Thanks. Yeah, that's a that's an issue that comes up continually here from many directions. And last week we had on folks from the UUMA Accountability Group who, who it was noticed are talking about only about UUMA members because that's who they have in their corral. But do you see um, do you see progress with collaborative efforts with other professional groups, Lareda and the 
your UMA and groups like that? Or do you see that the direction? Because I'm really curious about, about how this culture does shift to a more collaborative one. Yeah, um, I do see progress. Although a lot of the leadership and a lot of the progress I've seen comes from the UUMA. And so it's, it's um, the idea of collaboration that comes from the top is, a, is just a weird sticky thing. Um, so the people who've got the privilege are leading all the collaborative efforts, which makes it not all that collaborative in my opinion. Um, and so getting, getting, you know, part of the conversation is getting the UUMA and the UUA uh, to understand that they don't need to be at the center of every conversation. And I'm, I'm going to be the president-elect of Lareda if things go <laughs> the way one hopes. Um, in June is when the vote will be that I'll be president-elect. And, and to your point, one of the things that I'd love to see happen is that Lareda, the musicians, um, the administrators, the membership folks, we have a joint center days. I mean, it used to be that Lareda was invited to the UUMA center days and then we were disinvited. And I understand there were reasons that you know folks gave I get it and it felt very like what what do I take away from you breathing the same air so what would it look like if and we would invite the UUMA of course would not leave anyone out and if it just started with us we don't need to wait for an invitation what would it look like if we um kind of built the collaboration that we want to see um we just do it and and what what does that look like um I think yeah. it would be amazing. I also would love to, I, I don't know that I've talked to you about this, but one of my ideas too is, and I think it's, there's gonna be an ethics, a joint ethics committee meeting uh, at some point in May. Uh, are you involved in that? I, I've kind yeah. of been, yeah, okay. I'm gonna zoom in for, so it, it involves the UUMA, the UUA, um, Ministries and Faith Development Director. I think Jessica York is gonna be there. A whole bunch of people. Uh, I'm only going to zoom in twice uh, as part of, I guess, the incoming board of Lareda. And I'm not even sure exactly what it's about. Do you know what it's about? I only know that it's a, a discussion of what a joint ethics committee would look like. Um, right. And I'm not sure who the joint is. I guess it's everybody who's invited to this meeting. But it sounds promising. Um, but, uh, and, not but, and my idea is to also do that with good offices. What would it look like if the joint professions, including the UMA, had a group of people who were trained in staff relations because one of the things I'm a good officer for Laredo. One of my surprises was that the UMA good officers are, are trained in contract negotiations and how to deal with boards and other ministers, not staff. If you're not a if you're not a ordained person and there's an issue with a minister, you can't go to your UMA good officer. So that's what I'd like to see. That those are some of the things I'd like to see happen. Right. Is that, and, and I'm sorry, in, in the Musicians Network, at least, um, or the Musicians Association now, um, it's there. we have good officers also that can't do much. Um, the, their hands are tied. So they, they can say, we, we see that you are in pain and we, we acknowledge your pain and we are so sorry that you are in pain. And that's sort of the end of the story. And so to sort of empower good officers um, or some, some pastoral slash ethical body um, to, to be able to really step up and say, actually, this is not right and something needs to be done about it and something can be done about it. Um, it, it, it needs to be part of the, part of the process, part of the, part of the progress that we see. Just wanted to name that we have people piping in from watching. I see a minister, a membership professional and a religious educator, a couple of religious educators. Aisha, you have a fan club, <laughs> um, you know, but Let's get back to the issue of unpaid musicians. How prevalent is that? And, and um, what specifically, I mean, there are recommendations from the UMA about um, appropriate pay and everything. Like how, I, I know the large churches generally pay full-time people, but I'm, I'm curious, you're talking about pay and also relationships within uh, staffs, but can you just kind of lay out the, the groundwork a little bit? Because I actually... I mean, not, not statistics, but just kind of generally. Was that, sorry, was that pointed to me or was that pointed to Asia? Yeah, it was for you about, okay. about uh, music professionals and yeah. how they fit into the landscape. Yeah, it's, it's um, music in UU churches, and, and this is true in a lot, of, a lot of churches, but most of the mainline churches, this is not true anymore, but music in UU churches um, is seen to be a luxury not a necessity. 
Um, and so as a result, we, we will pay somebody when we can. We will bring in the pianist who's the cousin of whoever when we can. We will hire the soloist when we can. We will bring the music director who's already working at halftime up to halftime when we can. You know, it's, it, that's, it's sort of like this, um, we've got other priorities that have nothing to do with the humanity and the dignity and the worth of the musicians who are providing our worship, the beauty and the, the, the quality uh, aesthetics in our worship. Um, we, we forget that there's a human behind all of that and that, that human has a life that needs to be taken care of. Um, and, and we say, oh, but the music was lovely on Sunday. We will have that again in six months when we can afford it. Is sort of it's sort of the culture of things, and it, it, and frankly, it doesn't matter the size of church. Um, there are twenty people churches that do this, and there are uh, eight hundred member churches that do this. What would it look like to make music a priority? What are what are what are people missing by by behave by having this as part of the culture almost? Um. Well, like anything else, it, it would look like putting the budget where where the mouth is, right? Um, it's it's nice to get a you know a twenty five dollars a Starbucks card at the end of the year from your congregation that says how much we appreciate you for you, for the music you've provided all year, but that's not going to help anybody pay any bills. That's not going to help them sustain a career or a life, um, and it's certainly not going to give them health care. So it, it's it really just a matter of putting the budget where your mouth is. Um, if you like the music so much um, and you have a pledging congregation, the money is there. I happen, I ha I've been working in churches a long time. I happen to know the money is there. It's just a matter of how you want to spend it. And some people, some churches prioritize putting money into the endowment over putting it into the people's lives. Don't even get me started on endowment. So Kiana Perkins is asking, who I just named, hey Kiana, who pays for the musicians for weddings, memorials, et cetera? Who does the family pay? Does the family pay pay or does the church? Wedding. It's, di it's different in every. It's different in every church. Um, most most churches uh, will ask that the family pay the musician directly because there are tax implications otherwise. So here's a um, comment from Deb Weiner, who is a music who loves music as a DRE right now. One of the issues is that music professionals seem to be regarded as gig musicians rather than those who are in a church out of a call or training or mission. I do see a trend among a few congregations to uh, First Universalist here locally has a musician who's the minister of worship now and really she's also ordained so it's different but she came in as a musician and music is so central to the worship that she's kind of the coordinator and holds worship. And I know that Dr. Glenn Thomas Rideout does that in a way in Ann Arbor. And I'm curious, are there other churches that are really making the musician kind of the holder of worship in that way? Because I'll say as somebody who's gotten to sit in pews in a lot of churches, that bad, bad music will kill a good, a good sermon whereas good music can save a bad sermon. I mean, if I have to choose between the two visiting a church, it's the music every time. I mean, just in terms of how I walk out of there. So I'm just curious if there are other places that really see the music as so central to the whole worship experience, or if we're still so word, you know, puritanically oriented that we think the word is the, is the center. Well, it depends on who you ask. Um... I think I think part of the problem is that uh, that musicians are are still so often considered facilitators for worship, um, the, the sort of placeholders. Um, we need so, we need something to transition from word to word. So why doesn't the musician do something? Um, and a lot of ministers, especially ministers um, who've been around for a few decades, um, a lot of them sort of have a, a self. Uh, how do I say this? Self-referentials? Maybe, um, but, but, it, but it's, not, it's not entirely their fault. So a lot of seminary training um, said that the most important thing a person will do on Sunday morning is listen to you talk. And they have this idea of themselves um, that, they, that, that, that the word, that the, the, the 20 or two long minutes that they have to say in, on Sunday mornings is the most important uh, moments in the spiritual lives of a people. And it's been proven over and over and over again that it's actually kind of one of the least important. 
uh, moments. Uh, and I'm not saying that music is always the most important, but it's, it's usually some combination of things. Usually central is relationship. Yeah, I'll just pull in a remark from Jason Shelton, who many of us know is a very active musician. Our movement congregations have to come to understand that music is central to faith formation. We're shifting away from music as, as an, an as an, I thought it said anesthetic, <laughs> but it says aesthetic, as an aesthetic experience, but it's a slow generational shift. So you see a shift generationally in that? Oh yeah, um, I definitely and I, I definitely see the shift generationally, and I see the shift coming from the leadership of newer ministers, um, but I don't see the shift coming from the budget. I also want to name uh, that uh, Duro and I, Margulie, are part of the Religious Professionals of Color group, um, and we were in Miami in March and had just extraordinary worship, and I and I want to add the element of. Um, the, the performative or aesthetic nature of music and how it's um, interpreted or felt. I, I wonder, and I'm going to wonder out loud, is this a European um, way of thinking or is this dominant culture experience? Whereas what we know from spirituals and, um, and even growing up with Arabic music is it's much more embodied and it's much more felt and it's much more spiritual. Even people saying the Quran, they're actually chanting and singing. It's almost musical and lyrical. So, um, and the, you know, I, I do want to get into, Duro, your um, maybe experiences, thoughts on white musicians who are classically trained in good music, in, in good music, aren't going to be just automatically become sensitive by organic organically it has it's intentional it's how do we appreciate and affirm that the spirituality and faith formation element of music i don't know did i make any sense i hope <laughs> i think so um and i've said this before and i'll say it again i i won't ever pretend to understand the ways of white folks um and but uh, but i can say that there is a european tradition um, that, 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 that comes into all of Western world um, that, that names or that, that holds uh, feeling anything in public um, as an impropriety. So, you know, that's, this is where we get the, the sort of the stiff upper lip sort of mentality is I'm, I'm in public that it's not, it, it, is, it is not okay for me to feel things uh, in an expressive and public way. Um, and that's passed down from generation to generation, from, you know, from place to place. Uh, and those of us um, with more sun kisses on our skin, um, you ha usually have an ancestry that, that doesn't hold the same thing. Um, and, and I don't think that a lot of uh, people of European descent understand how, how um, unwelcoming a, a, um, a place can be if there isn't the, the sense of, of welcoming and holding an embodiment, uh, embodiment practice. That does not mean, that does not mean that an embodiment practice needs to be mimicked or, or stolen or exercised irresponsibly. It just means that when it arrives at your door, you welcome it. Can you say more, about, say more that? about that? <laughs> <laughs> say more about which? not misappropriating. So how, how to affirm the faith formation without appropriation or making fun of, or, you know, making it inappropriate. Yeah. You know, um, I'm going to get myself into trouble here if I, if I'm not careful, but I was in a worship planning meeting, not, not so long ago. Um, and one of the people in our meeting, we were planning a, a, a service that was um, centered around gospel music, or at least the, the gospel music was a big part of the service. Um, and that was fine. I was happy to do that. Um, it was also a multi-generational service. And so one of the questions that the, one of the people in the worship planning meeting had was, well, you know, there's going to be young people in the room. So do you think that they're going to, you know, it's going, there's going to be gospel music. Do you think they're going to be able to dance or get up and move? And, and, you know, I just had to say as politely as I can, and I'm not often very polite, but I had to say, you know, the, the music of my people is not your dance party. Um, and so it's, it's sort of, it's, it's sort of understanding the function of this music. Gospel music is a spiritual practice. 
Um, it is not, it is not a, a, an entertainment for, for white folks. Um, it, is, it, is, it is embodied because it is that deeply felt in the people that hold that music. It is not embodied because we need something to do with, to get our wiggles out. Um, so, I mean, that's just one example. Uh, there are any number of examples um, that can go as fair skinned to European Judaism and as dark skinned to, uh, to historic Africanism um, or even current Africanism in a lot of senses. I think we've all been in that, um, those many kind of white suburban churches hearing a congregation sing no more auction block for me. <laughs> going, are you kidding me? You know, um, put yourself in that scene and see where you are, white people, you know? So, um, I mean, at least for me, if I think of an auction block, it, it is not a spiritual thing. It is a, it's a place of horror as the person benefiting from the auction block. So um, I'm really curious about the use of spirituals in general and how you see, uh, for instance, we did not sing um, the Black National Anthem uh, on Martin Luther King Day and the, the two Black people in the church, one of the churches that I know were really upset that we didn't. And I was like, I, I'm just trying to sort through for predominantly white, like really white congregations, where to start with sensitivity and awareness. One thing that I've been thinking about lately a lot is how seemingly obsessed um, white liberal intellectuals are with story, um, this need for story, um, so much so that the story takes precedent often over the people in the story. Um, and so, and so that, this is how things happen, like, like auction block in a worship service, because we get obsessed with needing to tell the story of slavery. We, need to, we get obsessed with needing to explain the history, forgetting that there are actual human lives attached to that history. Um, and forgetting even more importantly that there are human lives that are that are attached to the ancestry that is attached to that history. Um, and some of those people might be in the room. Um, and so we, we just, we, we get so, so over, and overwhelmed by the sense of story that that becomes the part that moves us, not, not the human lives part. Well, it becomes an intellectual exercise, which removes us from embodiment. And James Baldwin talked about that, about white people from being disconnected from themselves, so they can't possibly affirm the humanity of uh, black and brown people. Yes, but that often also means that they insert themselves inappropriately. Um, this story has nothing Amen. to do about with me, so let me insert myself into the story so that I can feel it. Yeah, Sophia Betancourt said, perhaps it could be, no more auction block for me should be a deep sentiment for our white kin. And it should be, except that I don't see white congregations singing it, understanding where we are in this. If, you're, if it is a story where our ancestors were in that story, either specifically or generally. So yeah, um, yeah I agree. That would be, it could be a way for white people to come to terms with privilege. But I primarily, I mean, I've seen well, we, one year at GA, all white, I think there was one black woman in a choir that sang, I don't know how my ancestors survived slavery, a Bernice Johnson Reagan song. And I was like, I do, <laughs> like, I, I know how my ancestors survived slavery. I mean, and, and I just feel that disconnect because the music is so powerful and wonderful. We as white people, I'll put myself in there, want to step into it because it's a wonderful gift. And how do we, how do we hold that, uh, the, the, the actual, and we don't have to talk about slavery, but, but the, the culture that created that, whether it was a long time ago or recently, how do, how do we respectfully engage with music from a diversity? Is it all about context or? Well, but you know, the music spirituals are not powerful and beautiful if you don't understand them. Um, if, you, if, 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 if you have missed the point, then, then the, the music lacks any power or beauty at all. And in, in fact, it becomes trite. Um, and I think that's what, ha that's what ends up happening. That's, that's why, you know, 
you can have a, a, a white UU congregation on their feet in the aisles dancing to wade in the water because they don't understand it, right? Um, I think the music can be powerful and beautiful, but it, it, it's not gonna come inherently to a lot of fair-skinned scared fair -skinned people. It's, gotta, it's gonna have to come with some, uh, some education and education um, that doesn't that doesn't happen in the form of parallelism uh, a lot of times the spirituals um you know people in the congregation might say well i don't know what it's like to be a black person enslaved but i do know what it's like to be a woman and and we have to, and and that misses the point um we can talk we can talk about what it's like to be a woman and we can talk what it had, what it must have been like to be a black enslaved person in north america and we have to recognize that those are two different experiences and require two different sets of music amen we, that's been one of the most frustrating things i've been doing a lot of workshops and people i had a white lesbian woman say she's a minority because she's a lesbian and and simply wants to know the POC perspective and it completely misses the point. But I found, well, I found my frame of reference is mostly white you use do it all the time. And it's so, um, I don't even know how to, re I mean, I do know how to respond to it, but it's just so prevalent. It, it feels like it, I don't, I mean, how, what's the big disruption to get people to stop it? Like, do I just say, stop you're going this is not an equivalency they're two different experiences that need to be understood within the experience they are not not it's it's what you said before Doro. it's inserting yourself i don't know that there is a there is i don't know that there is a fix um because we are so deeply committed to intellectualism um i don't know that there's a fix until we can we can abandon um, our reliance on intellectualism. I'm not saying we have to be dumb people. I'm not saying that we have to get rid of our brains. But if we can say, if we can walk into a church space and say and, and affirm mystery and affirm spirit and affirm that which we cannot know, and even if we have to call that science or scientific theory, whatever we have to do to get there, just get there. Um, until and until we do, I just don't know that there's going to be a fix because. Um, we ration and reason our way into these situations every single time. Dr. Sophia Betancourt, again, uh, kind of a blessing and similar to what you were just saying. May our worship be about deep meaning, wrestling, learning, mourning, and appropriate lamentation. May praise come from the possibility that we might one day find our collective salvation. It's a beautiful vision, and I wonder where... Um, you mentioned the worship at Finding Our Way Home or other places where that is a description of worship as actually experienced. Well, I don't know. This is where my ego comes in, uh, and I do have one, as you might, as you may know. Um, I think the it's 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 funny to me. Um, that often people will tell you the best worship they've ever experienced in a UU space was either led by a person of color or by a musician. And the absolute life-changing worship experiences that people name are almost always led by musicians of color. And so I wonder when we'll get it. Like when, when are we gonna understand that there is something there to pay attention to? Um, instead, of, instead of just, you know, hiring Dr. Wright out to come out to our, our thing when we feel like we need a little excitement in the room or, or whatever it is that we do. Um, when are we gonna understand that there's, a real, there's real potential for leadership and, and example setting through our musicians of color? I, I think it's when we I think it's when we decent or ordained ministry. I say that with respect. I think when we value what musicians of color, what religious education, what we bring to 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 affirm the the mystery and the holy that we all what, what that brings us together. And I don't I don't I say this with respect because we need spiritual leaders and our musicians, our musicians of color are spiritual leaders. That, that's when I think I think we've created this one model. I think it's starting to happen um, because because yes, every when I list my top ten best worships ever, they were always led by musicians of color and um, 
ministers of color. Mm -hmm. So I'm really curious about this music as faith formation. Uh, that's not a concept I've ever actually thought about. And so I'm curious, um, both Asia and Dero think about faith formation, I'm sure in really different ways. Like where, how does music uh, fit into that uh, for, for all ages, but in worship, but generally, I'm, I mean, certainly when I think about it, music has been the absolute center of my faith formation, but it hasn't had to do with church. So I'm just curious, um, you know, as I am an old lesbian in the, in the 80s, women's music was where I went for solace, where I went for healing, where I went for transformation, 70s and 80s. So I, I'm really curious, you know, um, I, I generally don't have that kind of music now, period. Um, but, but I'm curious where you've seen like music it, within UUism, if possible, uh, relate to faith formation. It's interesting um, because in a lot of um, black Christian traditions, um, people in those traditions who've been in those traditions for a long time can often name the hymn that was being sung the moment they were baptized. They can name uh, the song that was being that, that was being sung at the at the moments that they sort of accepted their faith. Um, uh, and we don't have that sort of experience um, in, in Unitarian Universalism because the music that we, that we choose is so often informed by our faith instead of informing our faith. Um, and so I don't, know, I don't know what it is that Jason meant when he said it, but at least in, in my view, I would love to see a world where you can enter um, a worship space and be completely changed by the music. Not, I'm not talking about having your mood changed because we often try to manipulate people's moods in worship. I'm talking about being changed as a person. Um, going, being in a place where, where you can hear a musical setting and a message that changes who you are and your perspective of the world and how you, and this is important, how you are to other people. Um, that would be an ideal world, I would think. And it so rarely happens uh, in, in Unitarian Universalist spaces. Dr. Rideout is particularly good at it, as it turns out. Isha, do you have a perspective on that? Because you could- I do, but I want to hear from Marguerite and then I'll talk. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. I was going to say, uh, when you were talking about that space, Doro, I was thinking actually of our uh, the last Finding Our Way Home, where, you know, it was, I went in, uh, it was a rough time for me there because of other things that happened. I, uh, I felt, um, and, and the, the thing about it is most of the worship services was more music than words. Uh, I, I'm trying to think if anybody spoke for any length of time that was, you know, so, but the music was really engaging and really, and, um, and it just felt, I just felt it very deeply. And the things that I was going through, the things that I brought with me when I got there, I felt, um, I felt there was a container there holding all those things for me, making space for me. I, I, um, I felt a change, that change you're talking about. So, um, I think those that dream you speak of, uh, <laughs> I think it does exist. So, you know, and you've mentioned, I think we do need to get the importance of music and not, not just music, but maybe the right music for what's going on, you know, not just um, picking songs and like, this is, you know, just kind of like making sure that the music fits what is happening. Um, so that healing or whatever needs to happen can happen. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't want it to be missed, Margalee, in what you're saying, um, because you may not know this, but uh, at Finding Our Way Home, in that room uh, every year are absolutely 100% the best music, director, music directors this denomination has just hands down. I mean, we can talk all day and night about other people who think they're the best. The best music directors in the denomination are at Finding Our Way Home every year in that room. And so I, I think that has a lot to do with, with this feeling that you're 
uh, that you've experienced and 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 to also the, the quantity and quality of music that you've experienced in those worship services Isha, oh, i'm sorry no 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 amen a thousand times to that and um the 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 other the piece of it is it was it was transcendent what was to me so um transcendent about the whole experiences of all the worships uh, at finding our way home every year really and this year I think just kicked it up 7,000 notches um, is that not only were we connect you know we connect with ourselves with whatever we're grappling with struggling with we're connecting to everyone else in the room and, and that's the part that was both just so life-giving and life-affirming but you're looking across at everyone and and we're in ourselves and we're with each other and connected. And that's what the part of the faith formation that is missing when we're making worship an intellectual exercise. And it, I, I've also been to Taze. Taze is the, um, I, it's music. I only been to one. I've not had the opportunity to go to another one, but it was only, there was no talking. It was chanting and, and, and it's a whole different connection to out of my physical self that just, you know, emotions and, and spiritually um, it's a whole different thing. And I think for children of all ages, but especially younger, I mean, we see the effect of music on, on children and how it, it takes them to a different space and, and the, our energies, you see, I think it's most expressed in children, energies change with the kind of music it is. So our, I think the cells of our bodies respond to music, which is why it, it to make it much more sensual rather than which hymn is going to match the words. Um, I, I mean, 90% of our gray hymnal makes me want to weep. I'm just like, I don't, uh, anyway, I, I'm okay. I'm going down a rabbit hole, but um, so yeah, I, <laughs> I want to affirm, and, and you know what I do want to say, and this is going to sound snarky, and you know, I'm rarely snarky, is when I left Finding Way Home, I said, white you use, I have no idea what they're missing. Like not centering the best musicians in our denomination, who, which were in Miami or at Finding Our Way Home, just, you, it, it would strengthen our faith. That said, again, 7,000%. Well, but also there's no time in UU worship I mean, our devotion to that hour, Jesus, we just, we have, we have to be in and out by that hour. And the beautiful thing about um, at least music in, in a lot of the Black Christian traditions, um, and as well as in Teze, um, the, the magic, the spirit happens in the repetition, in the, in the doing it enough times that you can get lost in it, and then open yourself to what the spirit has to offer. And we don't have time to repeat things. In you, you worship by the t by the third time through, people are like, okay, when are we getting out of here? I'm gonna miss my brunch appointment, like whatever it is, right? Um, and so there's just a there's and uh, you know unless there's a dramatic cultural shift, I just don't see how we can invite the spirit in that way, in in that very concise hour. A couple of people have spoken up about performance and entertainment as white supremacy concepts, as well as the intellectualism. And I, I wonder where you see that fit in because that kind of connectivity that you're talking about, Aisha, to me is what spiritually based music means. But I feel like, and, and for some of the musicians, it is about who, who come in, it is about, I'm a great musician, let me show you how great of a musician I am. So how, can you describe the difference or is it, if people don't get it, they just don't get it. <laughs> Well, from my view, it's two things, um, and I'll start with I'll start here by saying that we've got to stop hiring great musicians to be in church and start hiring great worship leaders. Um, it doesn't matter how I mean, it does matter how well you play the piano. It does matter how well you uh, how good of a musician you are. But if you don't have a spirit and heart for for ministry or for worship leadership, then this is not the place for you, right? Um, no matter how good you are. The other thing I'll say is that uh, is is that thing about the budget again. Um, so often there's only room in the budget to bring somebody in on Sunday morning, instead of having a conversation, instead of uh, of, of developing a professional, a worship professional. Um, so often all all we've got is the the sixty five dollars a week that that Susie will get to come and play the hymns, um, and then sometimes the minister will try to lead them. Margali, you were going to say something before? I was. What I was going to say, I was thinking 
Oh, oh, I thought I was muted again. I was thinking, Dora, as you were talking about our commitment to that hour, I think in addition to that commitment to the hour is a commitment to the hour and, and making sure that the sermon gets its time, gets its space, right? So I think if we actually did co-ministry where there is room for the for word, there is room for music and it's not just a placeholder, you know, I think that would change things. Maybe we could keep that hour and go over it uh, some, but I think it's that co-ministry piece we're, we're, we're missing. If there was truly co-ministry and not music as a placeholder or, um, or the part for children, you know, it's like, you know, we read the story to them and then they leave the congregation. If it was really co-ministry all around, I think, um, and then sometimes that would mean music would take precedent you know, and sometimes something else would, but the commitment to always have those 20 minutes, you know, 17, 20 minutes for the sermon, I think that's, that's the piece. Um, I think that becomes central. So then everything else is uh, working around that or working to lift that up. So that's what came to me when you were talking about um, that, that hour and, and commitment to it. So. Mm -hmm. And also there's not the real sense um, in a lot of UU worship spaces that there is really no better place to be on Sunday morning. Um, a lot of us, a lot of people show up out of obligation or out of routine or out of tradition or out of whatever, um, but the worship does not provide the sense that there's really no better place to be. Um, and when people don't show up, they don't often think that they've missed anything by not being in there, by not being there. Yes, and, and that's, I think, when, um, that's what's so powerful about why I move heaven and earth to be a finding our way home every year is there is no better place to be than, than those, I mean, the whole experience, but that's such a good point that it's a, meh, show up, not show up. So what does that say about what, how we are, how we are embodying Unitarian Universalism if it's just simply, you're not missing anything if you miss Sunday morning and being with each other. And yeah, that's powerful. And since Finding Our Way keeps coming up, I want to just also note that um, part of what makes Finding Our Way Home uh, meaningful and powerful is that it comes from a sense of shared experience among the, the attendees. Um, there's, you know, even though we're all very different, we do different things for a living, we're different ethnicities, we're different ages, we're different all the, theological beliefs. Um, the shared experience um, is really central, um, and and we don't we don't talk enough about what the shared ex we talk a lot about pluralism, but we don't talk a lot about the shared experience in UU worship, um, and and often and that's because the the only shared experience um, is the level of education or um, the commitments to the environment or whatever really that we, we just don't talk enough about about wh what it what it means to be us and what it means to to live spiritually through our lives together um so finding our way home we can we can we can gather and talk about and and pray about and sing about what it's like to have been spending the whole year working with white people and the damage that's done to us and the blessings that we found through it and all that um but through a shared experience right um, and we can find beauty in our work and our vocation again uh, through that renewal and through that spirit. We don't do that from a week to week basis uh, in UU churches often. I'm really intrigued by that notion. Can you say a little bit? I'm like, huh, <laughs> because I feel like there's um, there there's so much awareness of our differing experiences. So what would can you? I mean, I can totally see why finding our way home is shared experience, but I'm, I'm thinking about the absence of that. Um, do you, can, is there anything more you can say or is that? Well, I don't, I don't know exactly what it would look like, um, but we talk a lot about diversity um, and maybe we need to talk less about diversity. Maybe we need to talk about, uh, uh, about, the, about commonality. Um, Maybe, maybe we need to, to, to talk out loud about why we're there. Do we know why we show up on Sunday mornings? Do we know why the people are there? Do we know why people come to church? I don't think we do. 
Um, I think we'll be surprised to find out often that that it's because of some obligation or because their kids are in the RE program, but what else are they gonna do? It's not quite enough time to go have lunch. So I don't know. That's mind blowing. Let's ask people, let's talk to them. It seems so revolutionary. Wow, what does that say about us? I remember when Dr. Anthony Penn was here and he said um, he wanted a church that asked him every week, is it making you a better person to be here? And yeah, yeah, I, this is hilarious, but I am both aware that we're running out of time and of Sophia Betancourt's uh, reflection of uh, George Tink Tinker writing helpfully about how dominant culture notions of linear time are some of the most damaging <laughs> legacies of domination and destruction. And that both and holding both of those realities, but um, yeah, I, I just, it is wonderful to step out of the clock and touch eternity, you know, and, and one would hope that that's where we would go together is to that out of time experience. And yet I, I can look back and maybe think of twice that's happened at church. Yeah, I think, I think part, of the, part of what we have to remember is that in order to make progress and in order to change anything, we, we have to also let things go. And that, it's that, that part that we're not good at, um, the part that we have to give some things up. Um, so if we're going to do this other thing, it might mean that we can't sing Spirit of Life every week. Or it might mean that the sermon can't be 22 minutes. Or it might mean that we, that our, our hour is flexible. Sometimes it's 75 minutes, sometimes it's 40 minutes. We might have to give some things up. That's hard for humanity, isn't it? Somebody was telling me about a philosopher whose name I'm not going to remember if he paid me. That humanity's problem is not lack of innovation. It's an unwillingness to let things go. So you, that's exactly, yes. Well, we are coming to the top of the hour. Is there anything you didn't get to say that you wanted to today, Duro? No, thanks for having me on. Aisha, you got any uh, last thoughts no, here? I always love talking to Duro. It's a pleasure. Yeah. So thank you so much for coming on. And Margulie and Meg, this is, as always, a great hour. Hour. Yeah, <laughs> I just want to shout out appreciation to the really deep and meaningful conversation going on among viewers today. I didn't get to reflect everything that was said, but um, not because Margalee didn't, as she said, run them all by us. But, you know, I just want to say some really talented musicians are in, in there talking and thank you for your work and, um, and everybody who cares about this. It feels like good community building to, to see your comments and to know that you're there. So thank you. Next week, we're going to have the UUMA executive team talking about what's new. It feels kind of like UUMA month, <laughs> May. I don't, I don't know. And um, yeah, congrats to all the graduates and all the people who are candidating right now and all of the people who are trying to bring a new day about Unitarian Universalism. Thank you. <laughs>